move on to the next talk and keep your questions to the panel if that's OK in just a, a few minutes time. Um, but we'd like to introduce Dr Paz uh, Tayal. She's a clinical lecturer at the Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospital as well as Imperial, who's going to speak to us today around dilated cardiomyopathy. Super, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you to the organisers for inviting me to talk to you about uh, DCM today. Um, I make no apologies. My talk is at a very uh, core cool introductory level, um, but I hope it will be of benefit to some of you in the audience. Um, and so our learning objective today will be to describe the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, recall the presentation of dilated cardiomyopathy, summarise the treatment options, and really importantly, review the importance of the MDT, uh, MDT in how we manage patients with DCM. Um, you will all have an MCQ to answer later, and, and that will be regarding what are the four pillars of heart failure treatment. So I thought we could um, start this through a case discussion. Um, a patient who I saw in clinic a few months ago when I wasn't on maternity leave, um, who was a 50 year old man with a few months history of increasing breathlessness. He presented to his local hospital in pulmonary edema and in atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular response. The initial echocardiogram done there showed a dilated and impaired left ventricle with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 26%. He was otherwise reasonably well with a past history of diabetes and hypercholesterolemia for which he was treated with glycoside and metformin and also atorvastatin. Um, so he was brought over to our centre and he had a cardiac MRI and I appreciate that many of you will have expertise in this but some of you may not have seen one before. Um, so I just show a, a normal cardiac MRI uh, on the left and our patient on the right and it's just a, a fancy echo um, with the left ventricle you can see in the normal individual um, contracting very nicely um, and we look at our patient and you can see here that the left ventricle has taken on this globular dilated shape and really with impaired contraction. Just some other features that you can see in, in more detail. If we look at the mitral valve you can see he has um, blood going back into the left atrium so mitral regurgitation and in this patient the right ventricle here um, has normal function. So in its very simplest essence, dilated cardiomyopathy is just a heart muscle disease with dilatation and impaired contraction of the left ventricle um, and the right ventricle can be involved. Um, so that's just really the simplest way to remember it. The clue is in the name. Uh, an important part of the definition, um, and this is the ESC definition uh, in 2016, is that it's systolic dysfunction either of the left ventricle or both ventricles and dilatation crucially not explained by abnormal loading conditions or coronary disease. So it's really important if you see a patient with uh, a dilated and impaired left ventricle but in the presence of three vessel disease this is not DCM and similarly in the presence of primary valvular disease um, that is not DCM um, and it's just important to keep that in mind. So the heart doesn't work well, blood um, backs up and, and fluid fills the lungs, the legs, leading to symptoms of breathlessness, swollen ankles and legs, increased fatigue. But there's an important subset of patients who present with more um, severe uh, symptoms, and these can be thromboembolic complications, uh, conduction disease, uh, particularly in certain genetic forms of the condition, arrhythmias, and incredibly rarely, but it, it can present with sudden death. So that's how uh, it looks when it presents, but why do you get it? Um, and this is a really complex area. The journey from a normal heart to dilated cardiomyopathy is one that we're only just piecing together the puzzles for. We know that in a, a subset of patients, environmental factors are very important. So infections, um, uh, external toxins such as alcohol. Um, for some patients, pregnancy is thought to unmask the condition. And then in another subset of patients, we know that genetics plays a very important role. The commonest genetic abnormality is in the sarcomeric gene titan, affecting 10 to 15 percent of patients. Um, but the yield of genetic testing can be, you know, around 20 to 25 percent. So it definitely doesn't explain all of the condition and, and really sort of problematically, over half of cases are still labelled as idiopathic. Um, so there's a lot still to be done to understand. And I think the genetic architecture is certainly of monogenic dilated cardiomyopathy gives us a clue as, as to why we're, we're still piecing this all together. Um, so I'm not talking now about uh, common genetic variants. This is, this is rare variants in monogenic dilated cardiomyopathy, but you can see 
the variance in a number of cellular structures um, can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is really in contrast to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is very much a sarcomeric disease or uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that you've heard about already, which is very much a disease of the desmosome. Dilated cardiomyopathy um, can be caused by uh, abnormalities in both the sarcomere and the desmosome, but also the nuclear envelope, the cytoskeleton. Um, so one way of thinking about dilated cardiomyopathy really is, is it an end uh, process, an end phenotype, but of lots of different types of um, pathophysiological insults. Getting back to our patient, um, so there were no real clues, no clear potential causes, no history of drug or alcohol use, um, current smoker, no preceding viral illnesses, no known family history of dilated cardiomyopathy or sudden death. Um, it's worth flagging up that he has three children and one sister, but who hadn't yet been screened, but certainly they hadn't presented yet with any symptoms. Um, because of the number of family members who might benefit from gen genetic testing and given his age at 50 and the severity of his phenotype, um, we made the decision to refer him for genetic counselling and subsequent testing. Um, in terms of other investigations, he had normal uh, full blood count, use and ease, iron studies and thyroid function tests. It's very important to look for potentially reversible causes, and particularly in a man who's a smoker, a diabetic, gentleman and with hypercholesterolemia, it's really important with this phenotype to exclude coronary artery disease. I think anybody who looks after patients with, with these conditions um, will know of cases where they've been caught out um, with something that, that looks very much like dilated cardiomyopathy but is actually coronary disease. Um, but our patient had a normal angiogram. So just to summarise the investigation of dilated cardiomyopathy, it's really important to take a complete social history and also a family history. And um, as Tefik alluded to earlier, it's a three generation pedigree at a minimum. Um, and it's really important not to just ask if there's any history of cardiomyopathy, but um, really unpack what, what patients tell you. Often in colloquial speak, a heart attack um, is the catch all cardiac term. Um, but actually when you ask about uh, it in further detail or get details, um, it can actually be a cardiomyopathy. Ask about early pacemakers, any history of unexplained accidents, deaths, drownings, um, as, as well as asking for um, a history of sudden death. In terms of viral history, it's important just to check uh, whether there were any, as well as respiratory, any gastric um, viral history, uh, which could lead to perhaps a myocarditis, which could then lead to a dilated cardiomyopathy type phenotype. Bloods, um, as outlined, either to check for potentially reversible causes or to check for complications of the disease, uh, as well as to risk stratify. Chest X-ray uh, and ECG are useful. An ECG very much so uh, to establish a baseline, um, both rhythm, but also uh, QRS width, which we'll come back to a bit later. Imaging, um, a work in a centre where it's very easy and straightforward to get an MRI scan, uh, which I think uh, offers a lot of additional information, but a good quality echo uh, is more than sufficient for making the diagnosis and assessing for some of the complications. Certainly consider a cardiopulmonary exercise testing for um, particularly in the more severe patients, especially if you're going to probably end up thinking about advanced uh, heart failure management halters, very much needed for rhythm monitoring and stratification. And as I said, uh, we need to evaluate their coronary arteries. So my talk is peppered with various uh, top tips and, and really one of my key messages to you is that DCM is very much not the final diagnosis. It's a phenotype, you're describing uh, a phenotype, but not what the cause of the condition is. And it's a starting point uh, to look for other things. So who, who is affected, how many people are affected? Uh, and really here estimates vary and the most generous uh, or, or loose description suggests it can affect up to one in 250 people. So that's just under a quarter of a million people in the UK. Median age of onset is about 40. So that's a huge population with a potential lifetime of morbidity and mortality. Some of the older studies suggest it affects up to one in uh, two and a half thousand. So there's huge variation and we're, we're lacking in good quality epidemiology studies here. A lot of it's been done through triangulation of other diseases. Um, in, in practice, we think between 1 and 500 and 1 and 250 is, is most likely the reasonable number. Okay, so going back to our patient, um, he was then started on treatment 
Uh, so remember, he was already on glyclozide metformin and a statin for his diabetes and hypercholesterolemia. In the purple colours are really the big hitter heart failure therapies that he was started on. So it's Cubitrol, Valsartan or Entresto, Bisoprolol, Spironolactone and Depagliflozin. And they represent these pillars of heart failure treatment. Uh, he was started on bumetanide, which was for symptom relief, so diuretic, and then digoxin and warfarin for his atrial fibrillation. And these pillars, I've hesitated, either it's four or five pillars, depending on which way you categorise them, but essentially the key pillars of heart failure treatment. So at the very least, you need an ACE inhibitor um, or uh, an ARB combined with a neprilysin inhibitor, which is uh, Entresto, um, a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist and an SGLT2 inhibitor. And the reason why is, is this treatment just saves lives and uh, it's associated with a 73% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality and a 26% absolute risk reduction with a very modest uh, number needed to treat of, of just under four. And so really the, the gold standard and, and the optimum and, and what we'd probably all want if we were uh, to have this diagnosis is to start these drugs within four to six weeks. Uh, the logistic challenge of that is, is a separate issue uh, and the reality, but if we're talking about uh, potential gold standard care, these treatments save lives. And so that's my other top tip from today. So what happened to our patient? Well, unfortunately, he was started on these four treatments, um, regular monitoring, but he continued to be breathless and there was no improvement in his heart function. His left ventricular ejection fraction remained under 30 percent despite treatment. And so the next um, option and what we did was discuss him at our multidisciplinary team meeting. And this is a really important um, forum and a really important meeting. It's attended by cardiologists, uh, surgeons, electrophysiologists, uh, imaging specialists, uh, specialist nurses, geneticists, genetic counsellors. And it's a really important um, place to discuss patients such as him because um, the management isn't always clear. So he, he would not be appropriate for cardiac resynchronization therapy because his QRS uh, was narrow and also he has atrial fibrillation. So he was referred for uh, an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Um, um, and as you were about to hear um, in the next talk, he was also referred to the transplant team for assessment. Um, at the current time, he's not eligible because of his smoking status and his BMI. And he was referred to the electrophysiology team uh, regarding management of his atrial fibrillation. Um, so just to summarise the management of dilated cardiomyopathy, it's very important to treat any reversible cause. Uh, those four pillars or five pillars save lives. Um, important to risk stratify patients uh, for an ICD. A slightly controversial area currently, which we're happy to get into in the discussion, but uh, the, the, it needs to be reviewed. Um, advanced care, so whether advanced heart failure management is needed. Family screening is essential. And then a number of patients, it might be appropriate to consider them for genetic testing and counselling. Um, patient education and support is really important. Obviously, as I mentioned, this can often be a, a young uh, population. I really recommend Cardiomyopathy UK or Pumping Marvellous uh, as patient charities and British Heart Foundation as well. There's a huge wealth of uh, information and resources. Um, and then we must never forget uh, lifestyle advice, including the importance of alcohol cessation, smoking, diet, exercise, um, all when we see these patients. So really the, the top tip here is to involve the multidisciplinary team to optimise care for patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. It, it's incredibly valuable. Um, and we shouldn't really be seeing patients with dilated cardiomyopathy just in isolation, a single doctor in a cardiomyopathy clinic, as there's often a lot to consider in their overall management. So this is the number one question that patients ask, you know, what will happen to me? Um, and it's important to think about what his prognosis will be. Um, and dilated cardiomyopathy is one of those conditions where outcomes really vary. Uh, some patients do incredibly well and recover completely on treatment um, and live essentially a completely normal life. And um, almost all patients with, with modern treatment that we have seen um, do exhibit some improvement in their cardiac function. Whether that's also associated with an improvement in their symptoms uh, is inconsistent. But unfortunately for, for some patients, despite best treatment, uh, 
outcomes uh, can be adverse and it remains a condition associated with a 20% five-year mortality and it remains the leading global indication for heart transplants and this is despite improving therapies. Um, and in, in terms of how we can tell patients in what their risk might be and how we advise them about their prognosis, um, prognostication and risk stratification in DCM is still an imperfect science. Uh, we have a number of heart failure risk score models which don't work particularly well for, for just dilated cardiomyopathy patients. One um, very important risk factor is this type of scarring that is seen on a cardiac MRI. So we give a contrast agent called gadolinium and as you can see from the white arrows it's taken up um, in abnormal heart muscle. Um, and with dilated cardiomyopathy, you get this stripe in the middle of the ventricular wall, um, just here and also seen here in the short axis view. That for dilated cardiomyopathy and, and a number of conditions is associated with a clear adverse prognosis, so an increased risk of sudden death, but also an increased risk of adverse uh, heart failure outcomes. Other risk factors in dilated cardiomyopathy include um, male sex, uh, impaired ejection fraction, um, and certain genetic conditions, so particularly the presence of a, a lamin genetic variant. But we don't yet have um, a perfect way of putting all of this together yet. Um, if you're going to advise the patients about potential prognosis and complications and the, the things to really be aware of and for you to be mindful of in your management, um, the risk of congestive heart failure, abnormal cardiac rhythms, so atrial um, and ventricular, thromboembolism, including the risk of stroke, um, and then sudden death, which is where ICD discussions come in. So just to uh, wrap up, today we've covered um, the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, which can be idiopathic in the majority, but also environmental and genetic. The presentation, including the typical symptoms, and then the treatment options, those four pillars that save lives. And then we've talked about the outcomes, um, which is you know, the highlighting the range of variable prognosis, risk factors for adverse prognosis, including um, mid-wall fibrosis on cardiac MRI, and the importance of the multidisciplinary team in managing these patients. Um, I understand we will take questions at the end. Super, thanks very much, Paz. That was a really super talk. I really enjoyed it. So um, yes, we look forward to seeing you in about 15, 20 minutes or